Hello everyone. In the mobile industry, we are obsessed with speeds or data rates. When ITU finalized IMT 2020 requirements, they put these numbers as 20 gigabits per second peak rates for download and 10 Gbps peak rates for upload. Since then, a lot of people who write about 5G or create training courses and even make YouTube videos have been obsessed with this number. They keep on quoting it without any caveat, like 5G will provide these data rates for sure. So in this video, let's try and understand these 5G speeds. ITUR recommendation M.2083, which is the IMT 2020 vision document, talks about the capabilities of IMT 2020 or 5G systems. Here, I am assuming that you understand the relation between 5G and IMT 2020. If you don't, then please check out our 5G for Absolute Beginners tutorial. Part 2 is a good explainer on ITU, IMT 2020 and 3GPP. IMT 2020 vision document talks about peak data rate, which is maximum achievable data rate under ideal conditions per user per device. For enhanced mobile broadband or EMBB, the data rates are expected to reach 10 Gbps. However, under certain conditions and scenarios, IMT 2020 would support up to 20 gigabits per second peak data rate. Again, this is ideal scenario. The document clarifies that for wide area coverage cases, example in urban and suburban areas, a user experience data rate of 100 Mbps is expected to be enabled. In hotspot cases, the user experience data rate is expected to reach higher values like 1 gigabits per second in indoor scenarios. Another ITUR report looks at minimum requirements related to technical performance for IMT 2020 radio interfaces. In that report, the minimum requirements for peak data rate are specified as 20 Gbps for downlink and 10 Gbps for uplink for the EMBB usage scenario. The user experience data rate is defined as 100 Mbps in downlink and 50 Mbps in uplink. As you can see in the figure from 5G Americas, there are no target KPIs specified for the user experience data rates. You can think of this 20 Gbps and 10 Gbps as theoretical data rates that 3GPP has to meet to ensure that 5G is considered as IMT 2020 technology. The good news is that 5G has met and even exceeded this target. So how much data rates does 5G support in theory? Before we look at 3GPP data rates, let's have a quick recap. There are two flavors of 5G. The one that is most common today is the 5G non-standalone or NSA. In the ITU IMT 2020 specifications, this is known as SRIT or set of radio interface technologies. The other 5G technology that will use the 5G core and be able to deliver the promises of 5G is known as standalone or SA5G. In the ITU IMT 2020 specifications, this is known as 5G NR RIT which stands for 5G New Radio, Radio Interface Technologies. Back in November 2020, 3GPP highlighted the ITU press release that formally announced the radio interfaces that conform to the IMT 2020 performance requirements. As you can see on the slide, it says that 3GPP 5G SRIT and 3GPP 5G RIT submitted by third generation partnership project or 3GPP along with 5GI submitted by TSDSI India meet the IMT 2020 requirements and were deemed to be sufficiently detailed to enable worldwide compatibility of operation and equipment including roaming. Just to ensure that you get the whole picture the IMT 2020 submission was based on 3GPP Release 15 and Release 16 standards. You can see the references to the documents here for anyone interested in digging further. 
So let's look at the theoretical peak data rates from ITUR recommendation M.2150-1. Annex 1 looks at the non-standalone specifications. The peak data rates for the LT part is maximum of 32 gigabits per second in the downlink and 13.6 gbps in the uplink. The peak data rates for 5G NR part is a maximum of 140 gbps in the downlink and 65 gbps in the uplink. This gives as a theoretical peak data rate of 172 Gbps in downlink and 78.6 Gbps in uplink. In case you are confused, please remember that in LTA Pro or 4.5G, you can do carrier aggregation of 32 component carriers. That means you can use 32 times 20 megahertz or up to 640 megahertz of bandwidth. In case of 5G NR, you can in theory combine up to 16 component carriers, which can be up to 400 megahertz wide. This means a bandwidth of 6.4 gigahertz. Of course, in practice, the bandwidth as well as the data rates will be far lower. You have to understand here that this is the ideal scenario. Most operators don't have this much amount of spectrum. Even when they have a spectrum, it doesn't mean they will have the maximum possible bandwidth available. The data rates that you just saw are ideal case scenario, which allows 3GPP to claim that 5G meets IMT 2020 requirements. Speed is just one of the requirements. There are a lot more of these requirements that is outside the scope of this presentation. Going back and looking at the peak data rates for 5G standalone or 5G rate, it would be a maximum of 140 Gbps in the downlink and 65 Gbps in the uplink. There is no dual connectivity with the LT part in case of 5G standalone. So no additional data rates gain due to 4G. This slide is from Huawei presentation back in May 2015. At that time, Huawei was already showing off data rates in the lab in excess of 115 Gbps. Surely, there they were not compliant to standards as the standards were not finalized. But it gives you an idea that the theoretical data rates for 5G are far more than 20 Gbps. There is a running joke about killer 5G application. When someone gets a new smartphone, the first thing they do is run speed test to show they have 5G. This also helps us get an idea of what speeds are available in practice at the moment. Unsurprisingly, this is also used by many operators to show they are delivering 5G. You can see some amazing speeds from speed tests all over the world. Most of these speeds are due to C-band capacity layer. There are very few millimeter wave rollouts and not many devices support millimeter wave either. There is also no shortage of people complaining about 5G speeds either. It is no fault of the operators really that some of the big vendors manage to convince the world that 5G is a magical new technology that will solve all of world's problem. Everyone wants it even though most people are not sure what extra they can do with it just yet. In the 5G spectrum tutorial, we explained how different layers of spectrum will be required to deliver an amazing 5G experience. Many operators didn't wait until they had a dedicated spectrum, especially the capacity layer for 5G. This resulted in end users being able to see the 5G icon, but not the speeds they were expecting. The most common approach is to reform the 4G spectrum using DSS or dynamic shared spectrum to show the 5G icon, but deliver data rates which are similar to 4G. The main problem with using DSS is that it's not a very efficient technology. The end result is a poor 5G 
and 4G that is worse than before. A recent report from 5G Observatory points out that EU countries that rely more heavily on non-pioneer spectrum bands such as 1800 MHz and 2.1 GHz bands tend to have below average mobile download speeds. Italian mobile operator Wintry, for example, has achieved 96% 5G population coverage using the 1800 MHz and 2.6 GHz bands, but its C-band coverage, however, is only 50%. The increased reliance on lower bands results in slower download speeds for the operator. According to OpenSignal, Wintry achieves speeds of 64.7 Mbps in areas covered by 1800 MHz and 2.6 GHz. This is much lower than 273.7 Mbps achieved in cities by rival Telecom Italia using C-band. Ookla, the parent company of Speedtest, produced a speed comparison of European countries with selected international players. As I mentioned earlier, in this video, I am just looking at the speeds and not looking at other aspects such as availability, latency, etc. From the chart, you can see quite a few European countries are touching good 5G speeds, but Europe is also where most of DSS is used. US is another place where DSS is uh, and non-pioneer bands are used. The availability chart in the article lists US on the top, but as you can see, the median 5G speeds are quite poor. Let's look at this final example of EE. In a recent announcement, they said that they have managed to aggregate 170 MHz of spectrum that will be able to deliver 1.7 Gbps real-world speed. While they have good amount of 5G capacity layer spectrum available, they are taking advantage of using all their 4G spectrum, not in DSS, but as dual connectivity in NSA mode. Eventually, when they transition to standalone mode, they will have to make the tough decision of whether to use the 4G bands in DSS for standalone 5G or just statically allocate some of the existing 4G spectrum to 5G. They are also relying on 4G in 1.8 GHz band for coverage in the 5G NSA mode. Luckily, they won some 700 MHz spectrum last year, which will most likely act as coverage layer for the standalone 5G when ready. They have always been a pioneer, so it would be interesting to see how they approach this problem. This brings us to the end of this presentation. Here are some references that are available for exploring further. The slides will be available on our SlideShare channel. Please let us know if you agree or you don't. Also interested in hearing your viewpoints on this topic. Thanks and see you again soon. Goodbye.